Hello everybody and welcome to the Living Room Church. This is our virtual service. If you're watching us online, maybe you're seeing this live in the Living Room. Well, uh, bless you. It is so good to have you with us. Um, great to have you join us. We're always taking a look at a different part of the Bible. This is our talk time. And so it's our aim as a church to study the whole Bible, submitting it to its authority. So we're reading words that were written 700 BC, which is just amazing. And we'll see how they apply to our lives today. Well, I don't know about you, but it seems like every time we come to the Bible, it seems like it's going to look in the mirror and you go and you see things that are wrong and you want to fix them. Or maybe you do, or maybe you don't. Maybe you just think, oh, let's just hurry up and fast forward and see what the song of the end is. The reality is that every time we come to the Bible, it is like looking in a mirror. James says that um, in his book of the Bible near the end of the New Testament. And it's a chance for us to go and to examine ourselves, to look at the pages, to learn from them. But what do we do with it at the end? We've got a big challenge coming up today because we've got a huge challenge in the chapter that we're going to be looking at. But it's our hope that as we study the Bible you know, week by week and month by month, that actually we see that God's ways are the best ways because he knows us, he made us, he loves us. We'll see that coming in the chapter. And we have a chance to say sorry we have a chance to repent where we know that we're in the wrong and give glory to God in our lives through obedience to him, where we know that he is in the right um, and live according to his perfect way. So here we are in the book of Isaiah. We're finding ourselves in a chapter which is actually a bit of a transition between the reign of Ahaz, who was a terrible king, and we've already looked at him, and the reign of Hezekiah, his son, who's a good saint, Good, good king. Now, he does have his problems, and we'll find out about those later on as we read on into Isaiah. But it is wonderful that we come to this, this transition. And the words that we're going to read here are written probably about 10 years before they actually happened, which is really wonderful to see, because we're going to find out more about the outworking of these verses as we study farther on. So Hezekiah is going to be the king now. He's not perfect, and actually he's still around with the same problem, surrounded with, uh, with um, Assyria, surrounded with Babylon, still pressurizing, still uh, making him nervous, and we'll see what he's going to do with that. But our theme for today in our talk is God is at work. So let's read our first verses as we see God at work in the city. First verses, we're going to read um, verse 1 to the end of verse 8, chapter 29. Ah, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped, add year to year, let the feasts run their round. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel. And I will encamp against you all around, and will besiege you with towers, and I will raise siege works against you, and you will be brought low from the earth you shall speak. From the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like a voice of a ghost, and from the dust your speech shall whisper. But the multitude of your foreign foes shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the ruthless like passing chaff, and in an instant, suddenly, you will be visited by the Lord of hosts, with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire, and the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, all that fight against her and her stronghold and distress her, shall be like a dream, a vision of the night. As when the hungry man dreams he is eating and awakes with his hunger not satisfied, or as when a thirsty man dreams he is drinking and awakes faint with his thirst not quenched, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. See, God is at work in this city, and the city is Jerusalem. It takes a bit of working out to finally get there. It says in verse 8, it's Mount Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. Verse 1, we have this name, Ariel. Now, that seems like an odd name to give to Jerusalem, but actually it's because it is, it's a description. And you have to go to the end of verse 2 to see that actually the, the city of Jerusalem is like an Ariel. So you need to go to your dictionaries and work out what an Ariel is. And actually, in the Old Testament, the Ariel is like the hearth of a fire. It's like that stone 
stone bit where the ashes fall underneath. Now, of course, the, the aerial for the people of Israel was underneath their altars of sacrifices where uh, they were able to make their peace with God through the different sacrifices that they gave. And the ashes would fall onto the aerial they're being described um, as a, a people who are being put under the fire. And they're going to be brought low just like the aerial is underneath uh, the altar. So although Isaiah is giving this prophecy, the people are getting on with their daily lives. Did you notice that in verse one? Uh, year add year to year, let the feasts run their round. You see, these people act as if nothing is going to happen. Nothing bad's coming. Now, that's a really dangerous place to be because they're getting on with their daily lives and their religious lives, their annual feasts that God has given them. They seem to be continuing on and on. But the magnitude of the danger that we're going to see is coming in the next verses 9 to 16. But for the moment, these people seem to be complacent. They seem to be just thinking, well, nothing bad's ever going to happen. We're still getting on with what God told us to do. Surely we're going to be fine. And that's so easy. Even in lockdown, I wonder, have you noticed yourself? Maybe just getting complacent. You know, it's very easy for us to, to sit at home and, and have church at home without the opportunities to serve others and to be looking out for the, the, the good of others. And actually, uh, we become accustomed to being served ourselves and that can make us really complacent. The danger coming in verse two is is going to cause them to moan and to lament. Did you see that? Um, they're going to be. They're going to have lamentation. They're going to be besieged. They're going to be attacked. God is going to act on Jerusalem through an army that is going to surround them and camp around them. And they're going to be reduced to rubble. They're going to be brought really low. Well, not literally, but actually spiritually, they're going to be brought to their knees, we might say. Just like ashes falling on that hearth they're going to be brought really low, humbled. They're, they're going to be weak. Their voices are going to be faint. Uh, maybe. Now, sometimes in the Old Testament, um, that the thought of ashes actually means that people repent and they turn back to God and actually they realize, wow, God, yeah, you're right. And so sometimes they put on sackcloth, we would call it, and they put ashes over their head. Maybe this is what's happening here. It's not clear and it's not even necessarily true that that's what they did. Um, but sometimes when people put on sackcloth and ashes, they were broken and they cried out to God and God would come and would deliver them. Now, that was when God would act to discipline in their lives. And yet from verse four into verse five, we see just an, an incredible transition. In fact, everything seems to be turned upside down. And so it's almost at that 11th hour in an instant, suddenly it says at the end of verse five, all of a sudden it's the people who are camping around Jerusalem. They're the ones who are brought low. Now that's really amazing. Um, we're going to see actually what does happen historically when we get to chapters 38, um, 36 to 38. But for now, what Isaiah wants us to do is to marvel. Marvel that even though God has brought these people to act on his behalf, he is still in control and he can end it at any moment. This um, this nightmare, we could say, is just going to be like a dream, a dream that that is gone all of a sudden and they wake up and okay there's nothing to worry about anymore a bad dream as god moves in to deliver in fact um, just to remind you again this is written 10 years before it happens um, but we cannot use this as some kind of a, a spiritual principle that well whenever we're in big trouble god's only got, always going to come in in the 11th hour we're not, we can't use it like that because this is specifically written to jerusalem and we do see how it works out and um, 10 years later um, but we can be confident as christians that god is controlling above sovereign over all forces in this world but let's move on and see what god is at work to do next let's read verses 9 through to the end of verse 16 astonish yourselves and be astonished blind yourselves and be blind be drunk but not with wine stagger but not with strong drink for the lord has brought out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. And the, vision, and the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. 
When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore... I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. You see, God works to diagnose. Why is this such a surprise to Jerusalem? Well, why have they continued to celebrate their annual festivals year after year, and yet this disaster has come upon them? Well, it's because of the diagnosis that comes in verse 13. Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. See, this is empty, passionless, formal, box-ticking religion. It's not personal faith. And this is the key to the whole chapter, actually. Do you ever feel like you're just going through the motions? Maybe you just click on that link that comes in in the email on a Sunday morning. You watch, you get up, you walk away, you forget all about what we've been learning. Or maybe you just take communion and it's just a thing that helps you to feel better for the next 10 minutes of your life. Or you just do your Bible readings and you skim read through it and tick that box. That's that day done. I'm sure we've all felt this from time to time. There can be no reality in our spiritual walk with God. No vibrancy in our faith. Just inner emptiness. Now, this is what Jesus calls the Pharisees out for. In Matthew chapter 15, he quotes verse 13, which implies that actually God is going to judge them through what he says in verse 14. Traditions, rituals that were invented by the Pharisees and put on the people that this is how you get right with God and make sure that you're okay with him. This is an obedience that we've made up that helps you to know that you are okay with God. Now, how does anybody arrive at such a place? How do the Pharisees arrive at it? How could we, how have the people here in Jerusalem arrived at this place? Well, verse 9 shows us the progression. And it says, astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. This is something that's self-inflicted. It's something that they've done to themselves. It's willful. They've blinded themselves. They've become blind. And so verse 10, God puts the seal on top of it. God works along with them and says, For the Lord has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. What a judgment. What a judgment on these people who've willfully done this to themselves. Those who willfully ignore God, who are determined to live their lives without God telling them what to do and embracing other lies are now put into a coma, put into a deep sleep. So their wise people are silenced. There's no vision. There's no truth anymore for them. And verse 11, oh, it likens it to a book that is now closed for them. One commentator says that one person can't even be bothered to break the seal. And even if it is broken, well, people have got so out of the way of their understanding that they don't even know how to read it anymore. Um, Even if you did have a Bible, and and let me put this to us, and you had a Bible and it sat up on the shelf, when was the last time you opened it? When was the last time you wanted to see what the Bible said for yourself? And even if you did open it up, would you even know where to go and have a look? Would you even know where it'd be a good place to start in the Bible? Has the Bible become so unimportant that it's like this book that nobody even knows what to do with anymore? Verse 14 continues the judgment and the mention of the word discernment. Do you notice that near the end of it? The discernment of their wise men. These people don't even know what the root of the problem is. They don't even know the heart of the problem. 
It's like the heart of the matter is closed even to the most wise that they have. Now, this sounds very much like the words that Paul uses um, of the, some of the people who live in the city of Corinth. Let's just read 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 and starting at verse 20 and reading to the end of verse 24. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What are these people left with who are spiritually blind? Verse 15 tells us in chapter 29 that they begin to turn things upside down. They begin to live their lives as though God is, is just stupid and wouldn't have a clue what they're up to. They diminish the value, they diminish the person, the character of God. They think that God is not their creator. We go on into verse 16 and they say, well, you know, he didn't make me. And they think that they know better. And so they say of the, th of the person who formed them, he has no understanding. So they just think, well, they know better. They know just as well as God. I know this sounds really dramatic, but this is the way so many of us live in modern Britain. We have forms of religion claiming to be Christian, even ticking it on a census form. And we're about to do that at the moment here um, in, in outside of Scotland, um, but never actually having a relationship with God. Bibles on a shelves left unread, little desire to do anything about it, questioning whether God has good rules for human flourishing. Or as Isaiah has said in chapter five, calling evil good and good evil. Verse 16 is a crazy upside down view of the world, but it is just so common now. But in case anyone listening will think, here's Andrew Agnew pointing at the world and saying, no, 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 you're bad and we're so good. No, these verses are written to us as Christians. They're Well, they were written to the people of God in Jerusalem. And as we'll see as we move on, actually, of course, we can apply these to us too. They're written to people who claim to follow God. And so they challenge us. If God were to examine you and examine me right now, people who claim to have the right beliefs, people who have claimed to have the right interpretation of the Bible, would he find our hearts cold, cold to it all, just going through the motions with a heart not in it, Although you claim to belong to Jesus, actually, you deny his rule, you deny his presence in your life through a cold heart that is more passion to hurry up and get on with this service and get on with the rest of your day and do all the other things that you're far more excited about doing. Hobbies, entertainment that aren't necessarily bad. It's just that you prefer those things to spending time with Jesus. These verses are meant to expose us. Maybe you feel a little like what you've been trying to do in the dark without anyone knowing. The Holy Spirit's now grabbing you and saying, this is you. This is how I feel about you. What do you do if you feel a little bit like the inhabitants of Jerusalem and you need some reviving? You need some heart surgery? Will you read on? And so we're going to finish this chapter and you're going to see incredible verses that I really pray will be an encouragement to you. Let's move on. Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. 
For the ruthless shall come to nothing and the scoffer cease and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off who by a word make a man out to be an offender and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate and with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of God, of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding. And those who murmur will accept instruction. God is working the city. God is working to diagnose but God is working to revive. This is so exciting. Everything that has been turned upside down can be turned the right way up again. The fruitless can be made fruitful. Um, the deaf can hear, the blind can see again. When God moves in his people, I just love verses 17 and 18, of course, um, but I, I, I love to get to verse 19. Um, and after all that John and Audrey have been teaching us through the book of Matthew, and especially in the Beatitudes, I love seeing the words meek and poor again. I mean, far be it from me to try to distill everything that they have been telling us um, over those weeks when they've been teaching through the Beatitudes. But this is about knowing our place before God and humbling ourselves, willfully humbling ourselves before God because we know that we need him. Isn't that what the poor in spirit and the meek were all about? Knowing our poverty before God who is perfect and pure and amazing. In God's work of renewal, those who benefit from the blessings of God are the ones who willingly bring themselves to their knees, not forced to bring themselves to their, to, to put themselves on their knees. It's as though the renewed senses of sight and sound um, are hearing from God in his word, the book. Did you notice that in verse 18 again? Isn't it wonderful to see that the book actually can be opened up and people can understand it again? Uh, a willingness to look to God is a willingness to go to what he has said. A real source of wisdom, a real source of discernment that was sadly so lacking way back in verse 14. Now there's a fresh joy, a renewed joy um, that we have when we come and when we are put right before God. Those who've tried to take power, who've, who've tried to control life, well, they're the ones who now give it back to God and they're the ones who are, who are really satisfied in God. The poor in spirit and the meek put their trust in God. Isn't that amazing? God opens up the book again. And so that mist, that, mist, that fogginess, that slumber, that deep sleep, it's now gone. Words spring to life. Unlike those in verses 20 and 21, those people who reject God, those ones who, who subvert um, good causes, like justice, as we see those people who stand at the gate, that was a symbol of, of where the court systems were uh, for the people. Those unscrupulous people have no future with God. Those who misuse, um, God, misuse people and take advantage of people, well, they're the ones who will come to nothing. But when God works in renewal, then we have people who, like in verses 22 to 24, have their lives turned around. Those who've been wayward, in verse 24, do you see that? Who were, who were astray in spirit? Well, they understand all over again. They have their eyes and their ears opened. They now look at the book and they understand. Um, those who might have complained before, those murmuring people, well, they now accept instruction. And we might say in modern language, they, they're teachable, even though they've been complainers and whiners. And you can see why in verse 22, and then moving on into verse 23, we have this idea that it's almost as though Abraham and, and Jacob were standing there shaking their heads and going, what on earth are our people doing? What our descendants and our amazing nation, our people? And of course, as we move on into the New Testament, we see that actually we are the true children of Abraham when we believe in Jesus. And people stand, they, they're, like they're standing saying, what are they doing? But not anymore, because when they're revived, they go, yeah, 
Oh, it's so good to see that actually um, they're redeemed. They're now able to stand and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, to stand in awe of God. The messed up are now washed, forgiven. And so this amazing family of God now give glory to God, utter reverence for God, now worshipping in holiness and truth. You see, God works. Let's close this off. He works to judge. He works to deliver. He works to diagnose, but he also works to revive. Are you allowing him to work in you? I mean, this is where our chapter today is leading us. We could be the person who says, yes, I'm a Christian. We watch church every week online. We agree, yeah, that the Bible's a really good thing. Yeah, we like the songs. We sing along to them. They're great tunes. Church is a real pick-me-up in a busy week. But that's the thing. Church is just one small part of your week, the smallest hour. And there's so many other things that you'd far rather do or so many other things that you're really worried about. I mean, I could list things, but I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to pick them out um, from everybody else. Um, You could fill in the blanks for the other important things that you have in your week that might have popped into your head during this talk. But even think about the songs. Did you sing them with your whole heart? Or are they just lit? that say the right thing, but the heart's completely detached. You can't wait for this talk to be over because there are so many other things that you want to do today. Am I talking to you? Now, I can't see your heart, but God can. And he can diagnose, but he can also revive when you repent. Would you like that? Is your heart thumping, saying, yeah, that's me? It's me, Andrew, and I realize I've pushed God to the side. And maybe you're a Christian, you've done that. Maybe you're somebody who's not a Christian yet, and you're like, yeah, he's really been so pushed to the side in my life. Well, you could be, you could be somebody who allows God to diagnose you and says, sorry, actually, I need to put you first. Actually, I've been playing with this whole Christianity thing. I need to put you first. Forgive me, Lord revive me so that I can really get on with living a life that that really pleases you. You could be that person that doesn't want to miss your quiet time, that time alone with God when you open your Bible up, you just can't wait to get into this book and just understand and see and see what God wants to say to you. So what you could do is just go back even to this chapter You don't have to go anywhere else in the Bible yet. You can just go back to this chapter and say, Lord, what have you got to say to me? Now that I understand this a little bit more, what do you want me to do? That'd be a great thing to do. And the happiest moments that you could have are when you know you're a child of God and it is well with your soul. Because nothing else matters as much as how you stand with God. Will you take those steps today? Will you ask God to diagnose your heart? Will you take time to confess where he shows you things in your life that need to change? Will you go to the words of this book and listen for God's voice and watch him speak to you? Stand in awe of God. Accept instruction. Lift God high in your life. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, what a challenge. We do not want you to say of our lives that we pay lip service to being Christians, but our hearts are completely not in it. Lord, you would rightly act to discipline us. Lord, we just pray that you will waken us up, open our eyes, revive our hearts. Lord, so that we can honestly give you glory and live for you each day. That's what we want, Lord. We thank you that Jesus died and rose again. That actually makes this all possible. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible love and your desire that we should be close to you. And thank you that actually you come alongside us to help us. Lord, we pray that this would be our experience every day. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you. And we'll see you again next week.